Stanford University. So today we have Howard Hartenbaum from Capital. He joined in 2008. Prior to joining, he was at Draper Richards, where he was the founding investor in Skype and was recognized in 2007's Forbes Midas list. Before becoming a venture capitalist, he worked at Hughes Electronics and business roles, and prior to that, held engineering positions at Honda. Howard has worked overseas for over 10 years in Luxembourg and Japan and is a graduate of MIT. Some of his previous and current investments include Nemo Lane, Reputation.com, Relay Rides, Photo Bucket, and Bebo. Thank you for coming to class. Thank you. I see some familiar faces from some of the other you know, pitch fests and classes that I've done. Um, and if any of you are in uh, Professor Mendelssohn's e-commerce class, I think I'm doing that on Friday as well. So if some of you may get to be stuck with me twice this week. So if you don't like me, don't come on Friday. <laughs> Save yourself some trouble. Um, I did this uh, last year. Um, and the topic was funding and talking about what are the different types of funding like angels or microcap VCs or small venture firms or large venture firms and all the motivations behind each one and how to approach them and stuff. And uh, that was an easy one to do because it's something that I, I you know, do every day uh, in my job. Um, today, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of try and run just in time on everything I do. So last night I opened up the, uh, the email from a week ago that what did I need to do today? Because I'm a firm believer in you, you kind of make the work fill the allotted time that you have. And if you have a week to prepare, it takes a week. And if you have an hour to prepare, you, you, you get it done. So um, hopefully today will be useful. Um, and the topic b being um, making the team work, you know, putting, putting together the founding team, hiring people, um, board members for the company, building a culture uh, for your business. And I'm assuming, uh, maybe I should, that you guys are all interested in entrepreneurship and that's why you're here, but is anybody here not planning on starting a business within the next few years? So one, two, <laughs> three. So a small number. So maybe this will be useful when you look at your friends doing a crazy thing, like starting, starting a business. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so the biggest issue with, with um, getting a company going, I think, is really the early days. And, and that comes down to who you start the company with in the process. So um, I see pitches from uh, a lot of Stanford uh, graduates. Many times it's a team of two or three B-School graduates. Sometimes there's uh, somebody from the engineering department in there or something. Um, but I would say that the most common situation is um, that a group of you guys get together and you say, I want to start a, we want to start a company. And then you go through this, pro you know, this process of what should the idea be and what type of opportunities are out there. And it turns more into a class project, sort of like a class project where you get behind the whiteboard and you say, okay, who has an idea? And then you, everybody writes up their ideas on the board and then you go through kind of a consulting process of force ranking the companies and this one's strong, you know, we know something about it, but the market is small and you kind of force rank them all and then you, you know, 90 minutes later, ta-da, you've decided what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Sometimes 60 minutes, I don't know. Um, and, and I would say um, the biggest um, question that you guys need to consider uh, up for yourselves personally and amongst the other people that you want to start a company with is why am I starting a company and what is really the motivation behind that? And if you don't have, uh, you know, don't kind of think deeply about that from the very beginning, there'll be lots of ramifications for that, like who's your co-founders and what markets do you go after and what type of technologies and what type of, you know, crowded spaces or competitive spaces or whatever. So, you know, in the main question for the topic today, um, you know, making it all work. Um, I would start off with the most important question is wh why are you even starting this in the first place? So that's the kind of the first thing that I want to talk about. Why, where, where that comes from. Um, and kind of the second thing I'll talk about is once you've made that decision and you're comfortable with it, then how do you kind of get going from the beginning? And that's mostly around who do you bring on to help you out, whether they're full-time or part-time or advisors or mentors or investors or your father or your brother's uncle or whatever it is. 
who's going to help you out. Because, I mean, any great company is not one or two people. It takes a whole team to build the business up. Um, and next is, you know, let's say you get over the initial uh, hump of getting it kind of actually off the ground. Um, what happens if there's some infighting? Or um, what if things start going well and you get into a growth phase? Then what are the things to really consider there from a team building and partnership perspective? Um, then, you know, what happens if there's real challenges in a company? Like, how do you identify them and how do you deal with them in the process? Um, and in the case you have a great company of people, but the market just, or the product isn't fitting into the market, then how do you make the decisions to make changes to pivot, which is kind of a popular word. Pivot, in my mind, it means failure, but we still have money left. But, you know, a lot of great companies are, you know, mo the great majority of companies that start end up doing something quite different from what they actually started to do. The surprising thing is that usually the most successful ones are the ones who actually started out and finished doing exactly the same thing. Of course, there's exceptions to everything. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about um, you know, uh, board level issues, like what does a board do and why is it important to your company and how does it help set the tone for your company and make sure you get the right people on your board and when, what do you do when you don't have the right people on your board and how you go through that process. Um, and then maybe discuss a little bit about some companies um, that are out there that we can just talk about, you know, the Amazons or Apples or Zappos or what is it about those companies where kind of from the beginning all the way through building the companies, um, kind of who the team was um, and what the culture was behind the company that helped them be successful and why are they great companies as opposed to, you know, let's criticize Zynga for a minute. Why is Zynga a crappy company? And is that culture based or is it something else? So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and remind me, until what time am I supposed to talk um, before we go into question and answer? Um, Maybe. Usually we actually do like Q&A throughout, so like if the students have questions, there's some. Okay, great. So when do you want me to stop that process and making sure I get through my stuff? So, because I can filter and add and drop along the way. Around two. Around three, or is it three? three? Okay. Great, so if you guys have any questions, um, don't be shy to interrupt me. Um, whenever I have entrepreneurs pitching me, I'm not only trying to absorb their pitch, I'm trying to get to learn something from them and get to know them, so I interrupt them all the time, partially to see. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. A question good, <laughs> good. About the uh, why to start a company. Yeah. From what you've sort of seen, do you feel that people that start from a place of, place of authenticity, you know, this is something I'm fully familiar with, So let me talk about the few points I have, and if I don't answer that question in the process, then, then beat me up afterwards and say you didn't give me the answer to my question, and that's totally fair, okay? Um, so have you guys, maybe you guys have read this book. I, I can't remember the title of the book. Maybe it's 10,000 Hours or something like that, which talks about, what? Outliers. Yeah. If, if, all the really interesting kind of uh, domain experts have really significant expertise in the, in the uh, I mean, the successful companies come from domain expertise in the field. You know, Bill Gates was the guy who succeeded at Microsoft because he was an expert at programming and understanding what was going on in the computer industry and had spent more than 10,000 hours working on it. VCs like me, we're kind of precedence driven. We, we don't know which companies are going to be successful. We're just looking at all of the parameters around what you guys are telling us and taking, this is early stage companies, like we are starting a company and we want to get going. And we're looking for things that lead us to believe that you have a, you know, enough of them that you at least have a chance of getting to be big, knowing that you probably won't anyway. But if you don't have enough of those things, then we won't invest. And the main thing is usually that the concept and the, the belief and interest in the company kind of comes from within. And it's not a whiteboarding experience where people say, okay, what new things can mobile solve? Let me think, hmm, I can find, you can find your kids if you know, okay, let's build a company around a mobile app that helps you find your kids. It's just not gonna work. And VCs will look at that, and if you don't have any traction at all, there's no chance for them investing. Maybe angels will, but that's, different story. That's a different discussion, different risk profile. So the interesting, the most interesting companies um, come from a domain expertise and a domain expertise like Mark Zuckerberg in understanding what do college kids want to do and what is the Facebook for and what is the value proposition of the initial service that he launched. 
I'm sure when he launched it, he didn't have any thought process that this was going to be the most important company in the world um, since Google. I don't think he it ever, he was just like, I wonder what that chick's name is, and <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's put on, let's grab this data. And, I mean, that's what he was doing, right? That he knew about the product and he knew where it was coming from, and he is a very smart guy. And he took it from there in terms of great product sense, and he got great people around him, and he knew how to do that. But he was, a, he was an expert in that specific product market fit in what he was doing. Um, so the lesson for you guys is when you want to build a company, you can come up with any idea and you can decide that we want to help parents find their kids because mobile technology enables you to track them on their iPhone. I have a daughter in college and she has downloaded Life360 and I know where she is at all times. And she doesn't mind because then I won't call her and harass her. She said, if you promise not to ever text me or ask me where I'm at, you can check where I'm at or at least where my phone is at. <laughs> That's good enough for me, right? Because she's my baby and I worry about her. Life360, I haven't talked with those founders. I don't mean to criticize the company at all. I'm just saying if that came up from somebody who knew nothing about that market segment saying, wow, this technology can do something exciting, I don't think it's a good basis for starting. So what I would recommend to you all is if you know, the great majority of you, maybe with the exception of two or three, um, are thinking about starting their own companies, don't whiteboard it in the process. Look at your background. What have you done before? What is your experience set? What are the things that you're passionate about? You know, it doesn't have to be some place that you worked before, but if you took a lot of classes in an area, that's enough to make you know enough about it to assess it. The, the biggest concerns about a company falling apart early on are that you just pick something that you, you don't know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, then it's, you're probably going to run into a lot of roadblocks. And that's just a waste of your time, frankly. And the second one is, who do you pick to do it with you? The only statistic I've seen in terms of kind of founder to founder issues is there was an article a few months, maybe a month or two ago about some Y Combinator statistic that they have a third of their companies have founder issues and blow up. A third have a founder like, it doesn't mean the whole company blows up, but one of the founders is out, they're fighting, they can't agree on what to do. And if you knew that you know, you met somebody sitting next to you in class and you decide to do business together, that you're going to do all this hard work and one third probability is not going to work out between the two of you guys, you might want to make sure you think about that filter a little bit early on. So like, I'm starting about like from day one. Um, the companies historically that have been most successful are typically one of the filters is people who have worked together before. Because if you have worked together before for six months or two years or whatever it is, then that reduces the risk that you don't know what you're getting into. Um, I guess most of you probably wouldn't meet somebody and decide to get married in a few weeks. You'd probably want to date for six months or a year or something first. That's no different. You're better off to get to know the person better. One of the big filters we have, like if there's 100 red flags to a company, way high, maybe number two or number three, is the founders haven't worked together before. Um, the Skype guys, for example, had worked together for 10 years. They worked together at a company called Tele2, and then they worked together um, building Kazaa for a few years, and through thick and thin stuck together, and then they were starting Skype. I was just like, remove that risk. The guys have worked together for years. They get along. They know it's not going to blow up. There's other things that can kill a company, but at least it's not going to be that the founders are fighting about something. So primarily, on top of the idea, pick your partner well. And if you don't know them well enough, spend the time to get to know them together. And I don't mean like two weeks. Um, a big red flag is people come in and, how'd you guys meet? Found them on Craigslist. You would not be surprised, I mean, you would be surprised how many times I hear that for co-founders of a company or the CTO or whatever. The first couple of hires, I found him on Craigslist. I never met him before. We've been working together two weeks and it's going great. And for me, that's like, that's a big reason to say no, right? So, and the reason I'm saying no is I don't want to deal with the problems of you guys blowing up later and having all my money stuck in a company where the founders are fighting. So think about it from your perspective. Do you want to have an obligation to an investor for millions of dollars when you guys can't even agree on what you're going to do in the process? So um, be skeptical. Don't get married without dating for a little while first. And forming a company together is it's like getting married, okay? Um, in terms of um, driving the decision process for what to do, um, in picking, in picking the people who is on the team, 
um, is important as well. I, who meaning what is your background on the team? Not just can you get along together, but do you complement each other? Do you, are you very different people? Are you similar people? Um, of course, I think in this case, there's no clear guidelines to say if you are this type of person, if you're a type A passive, aggressive person, then you should partner with somebody who's very passive. Or if you're a marketing person, you should partner together with a technical person. I think that there's um, lots more uh, examples that, that show it's very hard to predict what that will be. Um, but what I would say is from a you know what you're getting into problem, um, if you're building a company that requires uh, technical expertise and you are two non-technical people starting a company um, and you have even a passion in a, in a lot of domain expertise in an area, I would not make the decision to, to like go full force until you have the input from somebody who either they're another co-founder or a first hire or an executive who has the technical expertise to even tell you if what you're doing is feasible, if it's cost effective, if it's quick, if it's you know, you're going to have the ability to manage it over time. You don't want to be making important decisions without having the sufficient expertise in your company to do it. Ideal situation from my perspective is both, you know, market understanding, domain expertise, and technical understanding if it's even possible to do it. And the, the biggest failures I see in this respect usually come from GSB students. And I'm not picking on GSB as compared to other schools, but I see more GSB students starting companies just because of physical location and what I'm doing. There's a lot of very smart GSBers who have great ideas for a company, and they start something without really understanding. You can already buy the so you know similar software off the web for a thousand dollars, and you could test the whole thing first bef before you you know with your twist before you even build it. And instead, they're an example was I was a, a, a thing a couple weeks ago where one of the pitches was a, a penny auction site for tickets. I don't know if you guys seen this pitch from your cohorts, or maybe you were in that class when I was there. I was on the board of a company called Swoopo, which got up to 30 million in revenue and then collapsed catastrophically due to a flaw in their business model. Um, and you can buy, it's, it's a flawed business. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it. And those guys, were, like, they had not done their homework. Like, they were, oh, this is great, and here's why it's going to work. And I'm saying, no, it's not going to work. Like, there's the whole model is completely flawed from a business perspective. And luckily, I think by the end, they were listening to me and being at least open-minded. But we've already got people building it. We know why it's different and why it's going to work. And they didn't understand the, the fatal flaw to their business model. That is a perfect example of they're going to go into a space where they have no expertise other than it looks attractive. They should have gone and found somebody who understood what are the challenges with that specific business, technically, market-wise, customer acquisition, LTV. All, for most businesses, there's enough other types of um, companies that are similar or identical that are out there that you guys uh, can learn from when you're starting a business. Yeah? Um, so I can talk about the ideal situation, which is like the Skype guys, and maybe one reason that was such a successful company is because they had both the technical and the market expertise and the consumer background. If you are two founders starting a company and you know you're missing a piece of domain expertise, you need to go out and try and find somebody else even though it's not the perfect situation. The perfect situation would be you know somebody that you know you can work with, that you've known for a long time, who happens to be the right person. but. That's not always going to be the case. I, I would say the, the ideal number of founders is two. History says that for most of the successful companies. Two is better than one, and two is better than three. So just if you look at the companies that have been very successful in what they've done, maybe two people are play off each other, or, two, or three is a crowd. I don't know what it is. But, so if you're two and you want to start a business and you're missing a piece of the expertise, maybe the third guy isn't a founder. Maybe the third guy is. Um, you know, somebody who's going to be your first hire or it's somebody who you have to say in the back of your mind, we don't know this person well enough, we better not call them a founder because there's just too much risk to that. Let's make them feel like a founder and put them in the founder circle, give them a few founder shares, whatever it is. But you have to keep in your back of your mind like maybe this isn't going to work because we just don't know this person well enough. Um, but you can also um, 
build it out with people who won't be full-time team members as well, domain expertise. Like those guys doing that penny auction site for tickets, the former CEO of that company lives in the Bay Area and they should take that guy to dinner once a month. If they're gonna pursue this, they should take him to dinner once a month, buy him a nice bottle of my wine and say, please just teach me everything you know. And then they can decide, they have the data, they have the experience. It doesn't have to be a full-time team member, but at least they're getting the information from, from a domain expert in this case. Um, I, I was just bringing up quickly, from a technical perspective, um, it's very common, at least at the GSB, so I assume it's probably similar at other schools, and I've seen this at Harvard uh, Business School, but I don't meet as many students from there, that two really smart people have a great idea, but they don't understand the technical piece behind it, or they don't understand how hard it is to sell to enterprise customers, or they don't, there's something that's missing, and there, I think, is a little bit more research that you guys can do before you've like already committed, like yeah, we're, we're doing this, like we know we're doing it, I would say be, a little, be like me, be a skeptic. Like that's my job and I think it's very helpful to be a little bit skeptical because it keeps you from making um, decisions too quickly when you don't have the data behind it. So there isn't a perfect answer in that situation other than you know, do your research and be open-minded and maybe the biggest challenge is commitment bias that you know, when, you're, when you've decided you want to do something, it's, it is human nature to have commitment bias and think when you hear stuff that's telling you don't do this or change what you're doing, you've already committed to doing something else so you tend to discount that in the process and it rears its head two months later, two years later and, you hurt, and then you look back and you go, God, that guy told me or my gut was, you know, there was going to be an issue here but, I, you know, but Ah, but I was so dedicated. I'd already made my decision to do it. You know, how many of you guys have bought public equities and then it's crashed afterwards and you're like, I'm not going to sell because I know it's going up. <laughs> Anybody who's bought public equities has had that experience. I don't think, unless you're just lucky and you bought one and it was, I don't know, you know, Groupon on the first day and sold it in the first week. I don't know. Um, so from, from that perspective, I, I would say um, commitment bias in building your team, right? So then, um, so I think we've, we've exhausted founders. Yeah. So at the GSB, yeah. um, it's almost common that everyone says, I'm doing a startup after graduation. Yeah. And um, Andy Rackler, who teaches at the GSB, has yeah. said that instead, a lot of people should go to like, the rising hot startup and then kind of go down from there. Um, Um, I think if you know what the startup is you want to do, then uh, I, I think you would get a great experience from joining a, a quickly, you know, fast rising company. It helps give you some credibility. You witness some exciting things that are happening and you hopefully learn something from that. But at the same time, you also have to realize that rapidly rising companies are sometimes it's just a fluke and it's just timing and that's the way it's working and maybe you learn bad things from it. My advice would be if you know what you want to do and you have the domain expertise in it and you think you have enough information and people around you helping you to formulate what that company would be, then I don't think it's necessary to do that. But if you're not really sure what you want to do and you're not exactly sure what role you want to play in the company or you don't really have the strongest co-founders, co-founder, you know, technical people, go and work at an Airbnb for a while. And then in the back of your mind, everybody you meet there, is this somebody I want to steal out of this company? And then work with them for six months and then say, I'm starting a company, join me. And that way you get to work with people, you get to build relationships, you see their strengths and weaknesses. It's a little bit easier from that perspective. But if, if you already know what you want to do and you have the domain, ex or you or your co-founder has a domain expertise, I don't see, there's a, you may miss a window too. You know, if you see an opportunity in the market and you say, yeah, yeah, I'll put that on the shelf and I'll come back in a year, I guarantee you, you'll be late. Because when you see an opportunity, it's a, it's a, you know, because you're reading the press and you're seeing other companies and you, oh, a universal wish list. I mean, I saw this great pitch from this entrepreneur, Joyce Kim, a couple months ago. And she, oh, the, and I said, that makes perfect sense in what you're doing, but you've got to realize there's a couple more out there doing kind of similar but slightly tweaked. She pinged me again yesterday and she's like, okay, I think we're ready to fundraise now. And I said, have you seen Wanelo? And have you seen their growth? And have you seen they're already profitable and they're doing what you're doing with a twist that's slightly better? You missed it. And so 
I wouldn't, if you see an opportunity, I mean, generally it shouldn't be something so simple that it's all decided in 90 days. Um, but market opportunities do disappear. And if you see an opportunity um, and you have the right people to work with, then um, I'll disagree with Andy on that point. You won't get bad experience, but I think you might miss an opportunity and you might, you know, then you get caught into a job that's paying you well and then it's tough to leave because it's, you know, you got your debt from school and all that terrible stuff, so. Um, in terms of, okay, so founders, I think we've exhausted, unless you have any further questions on that. Uh, um, then it's, you know, who do you, who do you hire first? And I, I talked about, you know, what's the, what are you missing in the company? And you're looking for more expertise along the thing that you're doing. If you're not technical, hire a technical person. If you're going to be a cloud enterprise service, then go make sure you hire some salespeople uh, or at least have experience in sales and marketing early on because if you don't, you have no idea how hard it's going to be in the process. Or if you are missing, um, depending on whatever industry that you're in, if it's going to be some freemium model that you perceive, go and get some people around who've done freemium models before because they'll teach you some stuff. Or if it's in, you know, e-commerce, get somebody who's done a, understands, you know, what lifetime value is and customer acquisition cost is and what does it really mean. So, um, domain expertise early on. And then it comes down to, you know, setting kind of the culture for your company. Once you're at a few people and you've got a little bit, maybe you're bootstrapping, maybe you raised a little bit of money, um, people who are kind of, you know, one of the things we look for as a reason not to invest in a company is a company that's driven by greed. And when people are motivated to start a business and they're like, yeah, I'm going to make a lot of money, they usually don't. In fact, they rarely do. And if they do, it's usually not the greatest company and it's not, you know, let's pick on um, demand media. I mean, it's just a horrible business. It's a public company. It made some people some money but it doesn't add any value to society. If you guys aren't f familiar with that business, they basically optimize Google search results. When people start searching on H1N1, they recognize that they go out and buy every like relevant domain name that sort of looks like H1N1, and then they build bullshit content. They pay people who know nothing about H1N1 to build content, and then they put advertisement next to it. So people search on Google, it gets highly ranked, they click on the ads, and then they have, um, garbage content, which is not what consumer, it's not good for consumers. It makes them money because they make average. It's basically an arbitrage with garbage stuff. And I mean, I don't know those guys and I hate to criticize them, but it's not a business that's interesting to me. It makes the world a worse place. And I think if you're going to start a company like that, we are thinking we can figure out how to arbitrage Google so that we can make money on advertising while we're delivering crappy content to people. I mean, how do you build a good company and hire people who are passionate about what they do if the whole premise for the business is some stupid arbitrage? That makes sense. Um, then there's the other extreme, which is people want to start a company because they want to save the world. And I'm going to save the world because I'm going to give 10% away to nonprofit, or I'm going to, um, I'm an investor in Relay Rides, which is a, a, a car sharing company. And some of the people there are there because they think it's really saving the world. Um, that's not the reason why I invest in the company. I don't criticize them for having that motivation, but I don't think that that's what builds a great company. I think what builds a great company is providing a very strong value proposition to everybody who's involved where there's some kind of economic transaction and everybody feels great about it afterwards. And so if, you're, if your whole goal is to save the world, go do a nonprofit. I mean, if you want to make a lot of money, go to Wall Street. But if you want to you know, build a company around a market segment where you're solving a problem that when people are paying you, they're happy to pay you. They don't feel like they're paying you because, you know, they have to or you're holding a gun to their head or whatever. The culture that the reason behind building a company sort of sets the culture for all the employees that you guys and team members that you guys bring on. And if you are doing something that you feel is really great and making the world a better place, everybody's happy there. Like, look at Apple. Like, those people at Apple are a little bit crazy but they know that they're building like the most awesome products in the world that probably every, almost everybody in here has an Apple product. If I don't even see it. Look, I mean, look at every laptop. Well, there's one non-Apple laptop here, <laughs> two. Um, but, there, were you from Apple? Did you used to work? Anyway, Apple, Apple, you know, like they just maniacally are making the, uh, the best products out there that, that the, and the people who work there are like, we're just gonna make the best products in the world. And they feel very passionate about it. And when you meet people who work at Apple, if they don't love that culture, they leave or they're pushed out, or, you know. But if you want to build a great company, then, you know, have the passion behind the products that you guys are building and don't just say we're going to be doing something that we're not proud of in the process. Did you have a question? No. Um, I guess one other thing that uh, um, 
When you guys are founding a company, you know, look in the mirror and say to yourself, are you a natural leader? Because a natural leader builds a great business. And the only, and the only way I can figure out how to define what a natural leader is, is somebody who has followers. I mean, I meet lots of really charming people who are great promoters, and I look at them and I'm thinking, I should give them some money because these guys are just awesome and they're just going to do great things. And then, they, and then they say, well, we have these eight other team members who are going to join us after we get funding. Big red flag. Because the best companies, they don't need money to get going. They're natural leaders and people want to follow them because they know they're going in there. So you look in the mirror and if you find people are like, I want to, go, whatever, I like your idea, I want to follow you, can I join you? Then that's like a good sign to you that you're setting the, the good basis for a company where there's, whether it's both or three founders. Um, are you a natural leader? Are there people who want to follow you in the business? And that helps build a great company because when people are kind of passionate to follow somebody in the business, it, help, it helps build a great um, culture in the business. Um, all right, so that's kind of the first section, just kind of talking about, um, I got 10 minutes to go, kind of talking about early on, what do you guys do and kind of the first few people you hire. Are there any questions about that? No, okay. Um, so let's talk about, um, uh, kind of, uh, let's talk about board level issues. So we talked about founders and employees kind of early on in a company. Um, board, you, you should think of it a lot like um, partners in the business. And who, who you work with who is not a full-time employee of your company says a lot about um, you know, who you are and what you're doing and who you're, who you're working with. And you should put together your board the same way you would put together like a co-founder or a first one or two hires of the business and bring in people who you believe will be, um, add some additional perspective, have some good domain expertise. Um, one thing that you should really consider though is, this, especially with an investor, is once you bring them on the board, you can't get rid of them. It's not like, I mean, if you have an employee who's not working out, you, you fire them. And if you have, if it's not working out with your board, they fire you. It's a slightly different dynamic there. and so. Most of you guys, when you go out raising money, unfortunately, you focus on valuation and brand of the firm. When frankly, the number one thing you should focus on is your relationship with the partner who is gonna be on your board. And ideally, it should come from a great branded venture firm. And ideally, it should be the highest valuation and not the lowest valuation. But this is somebody, this is like, uh, you know, a marriage you can't get out of. So if you end up with, you know, I, numerous times I've seen people like not do the research on the, on the potential board member investor. They're, build, they're building a board. They're just like, oh, it's just going to raise my valuation. I'm getting the biggest brand. How many times have I seen um, companies where they've picked a specific, and I'll leave the poor VC out of it, but I know some VCs who with 100% history have fired and removed from the company the founder, co-founder, CEO within the first six months. 100%, I can name three VCs who do that. They're all perfectly nice people. The surprising thing to me is that sometimes I meet a founder who says, I didn't know that when I took their money. Like, shame on you, right? You're building your board. You should do research on the people that you're bringing in, particularly on the investors, because you can't get rid of them. And outside board members, some, yeah. Um, I would just look at their portfolio, like if you're like got a term sheet or you think you're getting close to a term sheet, I would just look at their portfolio page and I would pick three companies at random on their portfolio page and I would just call the CEO on the phone and say, hey, when you started this company, were you the guy or girl who brought in the money? And if, if everyone you called, like, no, no, we were all brought in later. I mean, You'll learn something, then you should maybe call a few more. Or if they say, yeah, I brought in, well, tell me about your, I'm thinking about taking money from this board member, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, would you do it again, do you have any other, and you'll get a lot, they'll be happy, and if they love the guy, they will say wonderful things. And if they hate the guy, they will say terrible things. Because they'll say, there'll be this camaraderie between you, the founder, and them, the founder, and they just, they want to save you from a disaster. And so if you're getting close, I would recommend uh, or you could just say to the VC, give me a list with email addresses, phone numbers of every company you funded in the last five years. And if they leave any off there, or you can find that they've left any off, they'll call that guy. So, I mean, I think the point here is you need to do your homework because this is, I mean, the topic building a team, 
This is a team member you can't get rid of in your business, and you have full control over picking them or not picking them. So focusing on brand affirm and valuation, while they may seem important, important now, if you have a bad relationship with that person, they will seem very unimportant in the future. Okay? And in terms of you know, bringing other people onto your board, um, I think one of the most valuable aspects of a board is to help you to recruit people. Like, investors give you money, but they also are another entity standing behind you that gives people you're trying to recruit into your company a feeling, you know, maybe there's something more here than a little tiny industrial shed and some card tables. And regularly, my companies who are trying to recruit some marketing guy and stealing him out of Pinterest, for example, picking a name out of that. It's a smaller company and that guy's like, yeah, this company's already too big, they didn't give me enough shares, I'm not happy here, I, I don't know, I'm not stealing anybody from Pinterest right now, I'm just using a name. Um, the CEO of my company will say, Howard, will you, you know, interview this guy for me? And half of it is me to determine if I like them, but half of it is to sell them. And I, you know, take them to my office, which is a beautiful office, or I take them to a nice dinner and buy them a nice wine. And it gives them a feeling like it's not just this little tiny box of a company with a few people. It's a whole organization that manages billions of dollars standing behind. And that is a great use of your board members, whether they're investors or they're, you know, don't just put your brother on the board because you're trying to stack the board so that when there's a vote sometime in the future, you know that you are protected. Put people on the board who have experience in your market segment. If you're going to be an enterprise sales company, you know, selling software, get somebody who was a VP of sales at a, he was early in a startup company and it wrapped, you know, Splunk, guy who went early on there to 100 million in revenue. He was there for five years. Put him on your board, and then whenever you have a topic, you know, comes up about early Salesforce structuring, you can all turn to him and look at him, and you'll get valuable data. Outside board members, it's easy to toss off. I mean, you give them short tenures, one year or two years, and if they're really bad, you just push them off and just say, hey, you're fired. You can do that. You give them a little bit of stock for it. But there's this natural, uh, when you have a short uh, cycle time for them, it's easy when you get to that point to say, thank you for all your great help. We've decided to go for somebody who's from a bigger company now or whatever it might be in the process, okay? Um, I just wanted to list, you know, I don't know how many of you guys have, how many of you been on boards before? So a couple, so few. Um, board is kind of a mystical thing if you haven't really had the experience. You're like, what does a board do? And some people will put it to the extreme of a board hires and fires a CEO and that's it. Some will add in that they approve the plan for the company or they might help out in other ways. I would elaborate a little bit and say, um, if you wanna have a good board, um, how you manage your board or how you interact with your board is very important. And one is um, always be truthful and realistic with your board. Don't overpromise because if you overpromise and you don't deliver, then your board is responsible to replace you. So be realistic. In what, in what you're saying. Um, boards look for things like um, micromanaging CEOs um, or a lot of turnover in companies, which means the company's not either not hiring well or not managing people well. Um, you need to think about how your business is running when you're dealing with your board. And if you're seeing things like lots of turnover, a lot of people are leaving or whatever, those are the types of things where the board will recognize and say, you know, What's the issue here? Do you need somebody to run HR to help you hire people? Do you, what do you need? The board should be helping you on this, not just looking for an excuse to say, okay, that guy's not doing a great job. We need to remove him. So you want people on your board who you will respect their opinion and you think they'll be helpful um, to you in what you're doing. And if you don't respect them and you don't think they're providing good guidance, then you shouldn't put them on your board. And once again, in determining that, you know, call people that have been on, who've been on the board with, this, with these people before. Don't ever put inexper inexperienced people on your board. You know, junior person who has no board experience is not gonna be a helpful board member for you in the process. They should have experience in doing that. Um, and finally, um, if you have no ops on your board, meaning people who do nothing, um, if they're your investor, you're sort of stuck with them, but you could always say to them, you know, start asking them specific things to do, task them. And if they really don't deliver, then maybe say, hey, do you have another partner? who might be able to help out because it appears you're not all that engaged with the company. Um, 
And just one other point about building team, there's, when a company is getting going, there's a lot of people want to be associated with the boards. You'll often have you know, angels or advisors or whatever, and they all want to be board observers. Um, I don't think board observers are all that beneficial. If you have good board members, you don't really need board observers. If you, have, if you make the mistake and you have lame board members, then get yourself a couple of board observers who are better to come and help you out so that you actually get some, some work out of the board in the process. Okay. Um, and real quickly, because I'm, I'm talking a little bit too much. Um, you know, I was just thinking about, we talked about Apple just a little bit. Like, look at the culture of, I don't know if you guys re, you know, read these case studies, but look at like Amazon as a company and what a culture that they have at Amazon or, or Google and what their hiring practices are. And, and they may seem a little bit crazy sometime, you know, what did Marissa say uh, for Yahoo now? We're only hiring people with these, you know, if you went to these top five schools, we'll hire you if, if you didn't. Um, a lot of people who didn't go to those top five schools feel very dissed by that, but that worked great for Google for a long time. I mean, they just like took their resumes, they filtered them based on educational background, and they just dealt with the ones at the very top. And at least they were putting people together who had similar experiences and were generally very smart, so they knew that they would get along in the process. I'm not sure the lack of creativity by doing that was a good choice, but look at their business. I mean, I think the end result is you've got people who are really passionate about that company who are working there, and they've done a very good job at hiring, building their business up. Um, Zappos is one that I think everybody likes to talk about because it's kind of a crazy company. It's very much driven by Tony Shea, and if you guys have read his, his book about what is Pursuit of Happiness, no, that's the movie, or just, what is it, Happy, happiness. yeah, Delivering Happiness. I mean, when you read that book, you feel, I, I get to join that guy. Like, that guy knows what life is all about, and if you haven't read it, just read the first 20 pages or so, and by, by then you'll, be, you'll read the rest of the book probably. Um, but he built a culture around like life is, you know, work is a very big part of life and if people aren't happy at what you're doing, then um, why bother? And when people are happy at work, they actually have good customer service because they like their job and they deal with their customers properly and you end up with a great company that people can respect and they love the service and the product and everything. So that kind of goes back to my earlier comment, um, you know, build a company that like you're passionate about and you feel that there's a drive behind that isn't just making money. So. Um, any questions? So I think that in terms of just kind of talking up front, um, that was what I was, I was going to say. So if there's any <coughs> specific, yeah? Um, I'm interested a little more about like the investment decision you made yep. in Skype. Yep. Um, so you talked a bit about um, like how with the founding team, you eliminate the risk of, you eliminate the risk of um, the two founders like not getting along. Um, but what else was kind of like a, what else was kind of uh, like a like a spark that like you saw that you thought made them more li likely to succeed? So I was kind of new to the venture business, um, and so they said a few things that caught my attention. I mean, they'd worked together. I worked with Bill Draper at the time, and he's been doing this for like 40 years. And he gave me like, here, okay, Howard, here's 20 things you got to know, and if you follow these 20 things, on average, it'll work. A lot of your companies will fail and it'll be miserable, but on average it will work, so just remember these 20 things and evaluate companies when you're doing that. People working together, people having real domain expertise, having people being a winner, like show me what in your past that is really unique. Um, and with those guys, one of their things was they built Kazaa, which was the most downloaded software in the history of time. You can't argue that they don't know how to build software, or at least hire the people to build the software, right? Um, they done. They understand consumers. They done something, even though it was in a. It wasn't a great business, and they got sued to death for it. Had to pay hundreds of millions of dollars for it. But they knew how to build really great sites. So, okay, you know how you got user experience. You know how to market. You, the team that was following them, they had four developers who weren't being paid anything, who had followed them into Kazaa and now wanted to follow them into their next company. But in the end, the decision that I made, I actually I sat at dinner with my wife, and we were talking about the company. And I was telling her how they were being sued for a trillion dollars at the time and what a legal mess it was going to be probably going to become just from all that. And she said, well, do you want to work for the guys? And I said, you know, I couldn't. She said, do you want to work with the guys? And I said, I could imagine working for that guy, for Nicholas Zenstrom. And when that was, I mean, I spent a few days with him. We wrote the business plan together. And that was mostly just a, an excuse to get to spend a, so a lot of time with them, to get to know them. But two and a half days with him, and I was like, I could work for this guy. And there's not that many people, I don't know about you, but you don't meet that many people that you say, I want to work for him. 
And that was the decision to invest, because I said to myself, I know he's a leader because people were following him. I know he's such a leader. I want to follow him. But it was easier. I just gave him money, and I got, <laughs> I got shares, and I didn't have to do all the hard work. So um, you don't see that all that often, but to the point where I had quit my job and followed that guy. But I see lots of cases where entrepreneurs are pitching, and I'm thinking to myself, I would never work for that guy. And when you see that, Thinking, thinking to myself, you know, why would I ever invest in somebody who I wouldn't work for? And it's a very important kind of clean, and just because a company has great growth or it's got a big business model or the guy's got a platinum education or they're really smart, if I don't, if I wouldn't work for the person, I think it's a, or I, not, I'm thinking to myself, I would never work for that person. That's enough to drive me away from doing it. You know. The most successful companies usually have kind of hard-ass, arrogant um, founders in the business. And if you look at the you know, great majority of very successful companies, they're blockheads. I mean, these people, like, they don't care what other people, I mean, they listen, but they make up their own minds, and they can actually be somewhat irritating to many people. And that's one of the reasons why they're successful is because of their attitude for how they are going to do something, and they're going to take in the data and make the decisions and move forward. When, I often take a step back when somebody pitches me and I'm thinking to myself, that is the most awesome person. I want to work with them. And I think that's actually not a good person to invest in. It should be somebody you want to work for. But somebody you want to work with is more like somebody who is, you'd want to put in your own club or your own clique or your own group. And Frank, I'm not, that, I'm not the guy who's going to start a billion dollar company. If I was, I probably would have tried, but I didn't. Um, I was CEO for a company for a while, but that was more of a battlefield promotion where the CEO departed and I was the biz dev guy. So they made me the CEO and I did it for a while and I really didn't like doing it. Um, the successful people aren't always the person that you want to be best friends with, but they are the person that you, mean, you want to work for because they're going somewhere and you believe in their drive and their vision and their intelligence and their domain expertise and all that type of stuff. And so in the investment decision process, like the most important thing, assuming it sounds like a big opportunity in a big market, then it's more a matter of, do I want to be friends with this person? Do I not want to see this person ever again? Or do I, or do I want to work for this person? And you know, there's shades of gray along every line, but I tend to avoid people that I hate. But if I respect, them, like I don't want to deal with them, but if I, re don't want to deal with them, but I know they're going somewhere and thinking to myself, this guy may be a bit of an arrogant pain in the ass, but it's people like that that work, and I could follow that person because I think they know what they're doing. It's kind of, it's kind of a, a, a strange answer. There's some VCs that they only invest in people that they really like and that they're chums with, and they usually don't make much money, those VCs. I mean, it's just the, that's the, the, where precedence-driven investors look at the people who are really successful and look at the personality profiles. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg's not everybody's best friend, right? If he was, he wouldn't have succeeded, I bet. So, yeah. So, um, the practice that we have been seeing in the Valley is that when a company is in good time, the entrepreneur take control. When a company is in downtime, the investor take control. Can you share with us a little bit of experience on that? Um, I think that, so the question in case that we were recording it and didn't grab it was, uh, in Silicon Valley, you know, when things are going good, the company's in control. When things are going bad, investors, don't they sort of take control? And, and what are thoughts about that? I think it's not, so, it's not so black and white. So one is there's many cases where a company is in bad times and it doesn't have sufficient capital to really turn it around. And because of everything that the board and the investors have learned from the company while they've been struggling, you lose confidence in putting more money in the company. And so in that instance, if you're not willing to put more money in a company and it's in, it's in bad times, it's all, often very hard to take control of the company because what are you going to do with it anyway? You can't hire somebody to run it because they won't take the job unless there's more money going into the company. So I, I would say if it's a company that you believe has potential, um, and investors are going to take control usually means they're going to put more money in right away and they will help the team upgrade in the process and sometimes that means firing the CEO. In many cases it's just the CEO's in, excuse me, in the wrong role and they need to put them in another role in the company. One of the things Bill Draper said to me is never let a wounded prince roam the kingdom. 
right? It's, I'll never forget that. And so when I'm in a situation where a company is doing badly, but I think it has potential and it's worth putting more money in, despite the fact that the money I put in already is gone, um, generally the guidance is you're better off to replace the, replace the person. It's, I haven't done that in every case. I think in the 45 or so companies that I've backed, I've probably changed the CEO five times. Um, and in one time, it was 60 days after the financing because uh, I, I learned right away that the founder was just kind of, he was out there. Like he was just spending money like he was a drunken sailor. Like no concept like, hey, great news. I spent a half a million dollars on a hardware pre-purchase. And I'm like, we're never going to need that hardware. But it was a great deal. It was basically like that kind of conversation. And in that case, um, I thought it was just inexperience, and we kept him in the company, and it wasn't a negative in impact. I think it was just lack of experience. I think the comment, you know, investors take control of the company is a little bit strong. Um, I, I think it's just as hard for a found founding CEO to um, go through that process as it is for the board and the investors to go through the process, because nobody wants to fail. And if you're running a company and you've started the company and it's really not going well, I mean, you don't want to fail in the business. And some people have trouble accepting the fact that they're failing. Others come to the board and they say, can you please help me? I think it's time to bring in some, you know, somebody else to help me. And it's every shade of rainbow color in between in the process. So I, I would not classify it. Like when things are tough, the investors take control. I, I don't think it's so simple as that. Anybody considering starting a company right now and have a question related to that company? Because it might be relevant to this. Yeah? So uh, I'm curious about starting uh, companies outside of software and whether you think the VC model actually works for non-software companies. So there's a couple out there that do it, but my understanding is the way that sort of venture capital is going to produce returns is for these sort of blowout successes that return the entire fund. And so it strikes me that you need, you need to make a lot of little bets, ideally. Uh, so capital light, sort of smaller bets are going to work in your favor. And you need something that scales very quickly. So that doesn't lend itself well to hardware type businesses, certainly not consumer products, et cetera. So do you think that it's just we should stop looking for VC? So I commented that venture investors are generally very precedence driven. And there is, I can't think of any Consumer, is it a consumer electronics or is it enterprise hardware? What I'm doing specifically, um, so I'm actually working on a, uh, a consumer medical device. Um, consumer electronics, there has, I can't think of any case where there's been good returns from an investment perspective. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money, yeah. gets purchased for a low amount of money. And so I've made the consumer electronics bets before, and most of my friends at other VC firms have tried once and they learned in the process. You know, even maybe the exit price was 350 million, but we put 200 million dollars in the company to get it there, and ended up costing a lot more time and taking a lot more money. It wasn't a good return. It wasn't a good investment return. I think on the enterprise side, there's lots of cases of very successful um, hardware companies like Cisco. Um, there's, it's just how big is the market opportunity and how good is the team at executing. So it's a very different type of business. So on consumer electronics, if you want to ping me later about it, I can give you some examples. It's just tough and maybe venture isn't the right focus there. Right. So. And, and as a quick follow-up, what about sort of the, the big long-term ideas? So there's like the Minerva project, which is pretty interesting, kind of a crazy idea, almost so crazy, you're like, maybe it'll just work. But do you think that there's a real appetite for these sort of big projects? Because that's what everyone says, but if you look at their portfolio, it certainly wouldn't so You have to figure that. time into it as well. And very few, I mean, we run on eight year to 10 year fund life cycles. I mean, from investment to exit, it better be on average eight years or less. And every now and then it's 10 or 12 years, but we don't want companies that are gonna, even if they're huge returns, it just, we would wait to fund them until later. So then there's only eight years or six years left. We don't wanna fund them early on in the beginning. Something like Peter Thiel, I mean, he's the kind of guy who will do something like that, but most 99% of venture firms will, so. Um, I think in the, it, yeah, last one, and then I have this other I section. Just like to hear if you're going to distribute teams. Oh, let's see the microphone. Sorry. Yeah, I was just asking uh, if you had any opinion on, like, distributed teams. I think teams. it's not turned on. 
Oh, it's oh, a yeah, camera. Okay, camera. yeah. Yeah. Um, if you just had any opinions on distributed teams and any take on that. Distributed um, teams. Like teams on different like continents and kind of are not yeah. in the same locations. Um, so there's you know pluses and minuses to everything. Um, one of the venture rules that Bill Draper taught me is put everybody in the same place so that they can work fast and work hard together. Um, when I told him that he had funded Skype and that their two founders were, one was in Copenhagen, one was in Denmark, and their development team was in Estonia. He kind of freaked out on me a little bit, like, didn't you listen to what I told you? And I said, yeah, but they've all worked together before at another company, and it worked for them before, so it's not really an issue. I do see companies regularly who have offshore development in India or something like that. I am strongly biased against um, uh, contract distribution, like a, a contractor that you're hiring in India, if there are team members that you're doing there and they work for you and that's IP and their know-how is going into the company, I think you know, there's a benefit to doing in terms of speed and cost. A big disadvantage to it is, uh, unfortunately, many of the companies don't succeed. And if you have a local technical team, you can get your money back where the founders can make some money from it. And if you've got a team in India, nobody will buy it. So, Distributing is certainly not ideal from a creating value perspective, but it's an option um, um, in order, it just keeps your costs low for finding the right people. Um, historically, there's not a lot of examples of great companies that were very distributed and it leads to all sorts of other issues. I, most of the companies I've had where they've had some dis distributed, a guy in Canada, two guys in Boise, Idaho, whatever, those people have all flown out of the company eventually. They just really weren't part of the company. They were sort of they were employees, but they were sort of like contract labor. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.